Hello listeners, this is Rick Miller here from the Miller and Everton podcast, back again for another exciting episode with another amazing guest. And today I have the absolute pleasure of talking to Professor Michael Crawford, who is a visiting professor at Imperial College of London and at also Chelsea and Westminster Hospital as well. He's a world expert in the field of DHA, which for some of you who are listening in, will understand that that is one of the omega-3 fatty acids and we're going to go into all the detail of why they're so important and how perhaps some of the history of DHA and, and its role in human development is something that we we need to talk about and, and obviously it's its relationship to different diseases and different uh, conditions and also for the men listening in perhaps even relationship to recovery from exercise. He also is the author of a new book called The Shrinking Brain, which is available on uh, major stockists as well. And we will put a link below in the description to make sure that you can get your copy as well, because it's a fascinating read as well. So let's introduce uh, Professor Crawford here. So hello, sir. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, Rick. I'm <laughs> glad we've made contact at last. Yes. I I know we were just we were just sort of bemoaning prior how modern technology is failing us, but luckily I've got your your happy smiling face, and we can have a good chat uh, yeah. this morning. So, right. Indeed. So as I mentioned in the introduction, um, those listening in may well know about uh, DHA as one of the omega three yeah. fatty acids, yeah. but I think one of the aspects that they may not be aware of is the historical context of DHA and its pivotal role in potentially the the development of the of the human brain and I was wondering right. I was wondering if you might talk us through some of that around uh, the DHA and seafood theory um, if you don't mind well it's a long story it's <laughs> 600 million years old <laughs> quite <laughs> so I, I'll try and keep it short uh, well, 600 million years ago, the oxygen tension of the planet reached a point at which everything life became feasible thermodynamically. And you had, uh, following that, um, the increase in the oxygen tension, you had what is called the Cambrian explosion, which mm -hmm. is the explosion of all the 32 phyla, that's the different types of animals and plant life that we have today all occurred in um uh, it's not quite a blinding flash but it all occurred it's caused the cambrian explosion because right. it was so fast so everything happened with great rapidity at that time <clears throat> and um this uh, this is after three and a half billion years of um uh prokaryotes sort of mm -hmm. messing about but not not doing very much but photosynthesizing and so producing um, oxygen and taking carbon dioxide out of the system and, and so so the oxygen tension rose and so it all began <clears throat> well <clears throat> the first thing that had to happen was that photons of light from the sun had to be converted to electricity to start uh, these systems moving and doing things hmm. and uh, we of course can't <clears throat> actually analyze what happened 600 million years ago but we have things like dinoflagellates which are very likely similar to what happened at the very beginning um, because it has a nice spot which can both photosynthesize mm. and can see mm. so it can uh can convert things into electricity when to make things make it move mm. and uh, and can see now this this little thing, <clears throat> the unicellular, <clears throat> happens to be extremely rich in docosahexaenoic acid. And it even has, now wait for it, um, in, in the molecular structures of the little thing, it even has a, a, a dye, a molecule with two molecules of DHA stuck in it. It's a di DHA, we call it. DHA, as you probably know, is the boss of the omega-3 family. It's the important one. It's mm. the one that's in the brain. So that's why it's important. It's involved in all the signaling systems. We know about this today. So it seems logical that the <clears throat> this little, or something similar to the dinoflagellate was actually 
converting photons into um, electricity because DHA absorbs light in the ultraviolet mm. and there was no ozone layer mm. so all you had was the planet was being pummeled with solar ultraviolet radiation um, unscreened and we know what, how powerful ultraviolet radiation oh, is what it can do today it can burn your skin and do all sorts of nasty things so um, <clears throat> so it's very likely that DHA was the original chromophore hmm. that it was converting photons into electricity it absorbs in this in this region and, and the pro that would then send little uh, sh shocks of electrical waves around the system and cause it to move if you put your finger in the three pin plug and, and get an electric shock to get oh. back so uh, uh, all these little electrons would, would um, cause the thing to move. So uh, it, it would on, this would only happen, of course, if it was facing the sun. Mm. So where would it move to? Obviously, it moved to the surface where the food was. So that's how really we envisaged it all happening in the beginning. And it was all the conversion of solar light into um, usable energy in the forms of electrons was being done, we think, by uh, DHO and jacosahexaenoic acid. So that's where it all started. And of course, that would start the, uh, um, uh, as it all became, began to become multicellular, it would initiate the beginnings of the nervous system and ultimately the brain, which which would come on, uh, uh, comes into existence only about 100 million years later. <laughs> and uh, was the fish. In fact, they may be even faster than that. And, and so when you look at the... <clears throat> The eyes of the fish, <clears throat> the eyes of the cephalopod, hmm. the eyes of the uh, reptiles or the amphibia. And if you look at in, in all this range of things, including um, birds and mammals and ourselves, if you look at the whole bunch of the eye, you will find di dha hmm. As in, we can analyze in the photos, uh, well, the, the foot, photo spots of the um, dinoflagellate today, which is, I say, was likely what was going on 600, 500 million years ago. So it, it, it is just astonishing that, that this molecule has been used in vision and in the neurons and synapses that evolved at this early time. And it's been used without change. No other molecule has been used in its place hmm. for 600 million years. It's incredible. So it's pretty important hmm. in the signaling systems of your nervous system and brain. So that's where it all starts. Hmm. And of course, it starts in the sea. So, uh, I mean, there was no other food available. No. That's an important point uh, because it, it, it starts in the sea and... Um, there was no land at that time, no. and uh, uh, the, the problem was, of course, that when when the ozone layer formed, nature had to find a different technique to uh, capture visible, what we call visible light today, yeah. which is in a different spectrum, much much lower energy than the ultraviolet. But um, it's quite plausible that this high intensity of, of ultraviolet light that was uh, was responsible for the origin of the 32 phylum because it, it is, it does mutate things and you, so it's very, very plausible that this very early period was what well, we know was very critical to life on the planet. Quite, quite. And and as you as you mentioned, um, Professor Crawford, the, uh, the this this quality of uh, DHA in allowing uh, electrical conduction let's let's call it. it must mean that it has a semi a semiconductive quality in, in yes. that sense. so yes. to allow yes. the energy to that's flow. what we believe yes mm. indeed we believe it's operating like a semiconductor but it, <clears throat> the, the effectively what happens is that <clears throat> it has um six uh metalline interrupted double bonds with which mm -hmm. uh, these have pi electrons that surround the double bonds and things mm -hmm. like that and, uh, in, in the present system of photoreception, you have retinol, which has a double bond, mm -hmm. a special double bond, a eleven cis double bond, and that absorbs a photon yes. at the lower energy of the visible region. And that's what kickstarts uh, 
what we see today. But going back 600 million years ago, it was DHA. And um, it, it, it very much the same sort of thing. You have these double bonds which absorb the um, energy of the photon mm -hmm. and convert it into electrons. So one could say that, uh, obviously... It doesn't, sorry, it doesn't, it doesn't really convert it into electrons. What it does is to energize one okay. of the outer electrons so that it gets into the escape mode from buggers off. <laughs> <laughs> so one could say that uh, in that distant past that, that DHA was in the operative position, but now thinking about the, the modern uh, or, or present construct of the eye, for instance, you have the, yes. the retinal... Um, structure at the back of the eye in, in the uh, in, in, in the retina and and now DHA occupies a slightly secondary uh, role to allow the flow almost like a copper wire yeah. I, I think of it um, yeah. in, okay interesting and 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 that makes me think uh, which perhaps we can come back to later about the the advent obviously of, of, of modern lighting and the way that the uh, the, the concentrated elements of, for instance, blue light, which we, uh, and that we use in modern LED lighting and the effect that yeah. that has on, on retinol at the back of the eye, um, how that might be disrupting that relationship between uh, retinol and then DHA consequently yeah. to the electron flow. So this is a, this is a fascinating area. And I think we don't know enough really about that. The... Well, we don't, we don't, except that blue, of course, is getting closer to the ultraviolet. So, um, mm. It's the high energy end of the visible spectrum, so Quite. you might expect exactly. too much of that would um, have some funny consequences. Absolutely, yeah. if you don't, especially if you don't have the uh, the context of the rest of the um, electromagnetic spectrum from the sunlight right. that you would have if you're just concentrating it straight into the right. air. That's that's quite a worrying position. Wow. And then, as you as you mentioned, obviously, if we move through early uh, human development, uh, this the, the natural source of of DHA in the diet would have been seafood, uh, presumably. And yeah. so, this there are obviously many different theories around uh, human ancestry and development, and and it makes one you know question straight away, given this pivotal relationship between DHA and brain development. Yes. Whether humans did evolve on the seashore, uh, eating yes. eating seafood, and that seems to be what what you propose as being our our sort of our ancestral origins in that sense. Well, yes, I mean the, 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 this idea was proposed by um, Sir Alistair Hardy, who mm. was an Oxford professor um, in nineteen sixty or thereabouts. That, uh, we were uh, spent spent a lot of time messing about with, with, with on the seashore. Um, there's a lot of antagonism to this for the reasons which I fail to understand. Um, but the, the, the reality is that you could not have um, gained um, an expansion of cranial capacity from 340 cc's as is present day in the chimpanzee, which was presumably what we started with was us five to seven million years ago. 340 cc's to um, the one, the peak of 1,700 uh, during the period of 28,000 to 30,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. well, you could not have got that expansion without. It's, it's a great simple. You could not have got that expansion without the building bricks. No. No. I mean, you can't put up a building without uh, bricks or something to. No. To, to make it, mm -hmm. and it's the same with the brain. You, we, it, it is absolutely pivotal in all the signaling systems, in the neurons and the synapses, and um, and in in the photoreceptor system as well. So it, it's um, you know, you just cannot make brains without DHA. It's full stop. And so I don't understand why people have hang-ups about uh, us, us having spent a bit of time at the seaside. Yeah. Um, I mean, that doesn't stop us going and hunting animals and things like that. Yeah. But, but by the time you went hunting animals with spears and arrows and things, you were pretty smart by then already. Yes. Um, so uh, the, 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 there's no question in my mind, and it's scientifically based and logical, that if DHA is responsible for the signaling systems of the brain, you're not going to be able to make a brain without it. 
Mm. And um, the principal source is in the marine food chain, which is where the brain evolved in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that's really simple, and, and you can't escape it. Yeah. Uh, I, there is, of course, in, in, in addition to this, uh, there's the fact that really the um, land-based food web is, is, is really doesn't have much in the way of DHA. So that really does put focus on the the, 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 the seaside, so to speak, but it's um, it, it's it, 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 you know, in effect, what we had was the best of both worlds, the land and the sea, which enabled us. And, and when you think about it, you know, a the brain developed in in a placental mammal before birth, and particularly in humans, seventy percent. Or of your adult number of brain cells have been formed before you're born. Mm. So the nutrition of the mother is absolutely pivotal to That's the, the um, development of the brain. Not the, the macho men running around with spears and things like that and, and, and trying to catch animals. It, it's, it's the women that are really important in this game. And they could wander around the seashore heavily pregnant even, uh, with a child in one hand and, and with the other hand picking up, because at that time, the food resource of the coastal regions would have been absolutely phenomenal. Mm. But totally rich with oysters, mussels, fish, um, all sorts of seafood of, of, of all different kinds, crabs and lobsters and mm. so on. It would have just been incredible. Okay. And there's, there are very few examples left today because 60% of the world population lives besides uh, coastal regions and, and the, we pretty well destroyed most of it already, okay. fish it out of existence. Mm -hmm. New York used to be the capital city for, for the, the world oyster <laughs> capital, yeah. you know. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and the, 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 they, they were selling oysters in barrels and things like that in the streets of of New York at that time, uh, in, in about the same sort of number that they're now selling hamburgers in, in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but that just uh, and it, it would have been an incredible, uh, rich and uh, resource for food for the pregnant women to just wander around and mm. pick, 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 pick food up like that. Absolutely, and it and it that kind of leads me on to another thought, which is if if and when, uh, well, when, I should say, um, more correctly, when human beings began to hunt land-based uh, animals, yeah. what what those things obviously did in terms of changing the, the relative nutrient abundance in their diet um, thereafter yeah. in terms of the development? Because if, 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 if Professor Crawford, you suggest obviously that the uh, human brain's cranial capacity has, has sort of shrunk over that period from eating predominantly and only seafood as as we started to eat more and more land-based animals maybe the you know the, the megafauna etc that would have been around at that time what then i guess is is the 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 rationale for for that given that the it must have been to do with uh the the, the energy density of those of those animals the fact that they were fattier um, there would there would have been more food available. It could have lasted longer, or there was other nutrients that would have been in there. I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah. Why human well, beings might have been on that route? You mentioned other nutrients. Before we get into the, the big question that you're asking, um, it's very important that in in the marine food web we get, particularly the the shellfish, are especially rich in things like selenium, mm. zinc copper and manganese. Now, these are involved in the enzyme systems which protect the brain new, uh, substances against peroxidation. Mm -hmm. um, you see, the brain uses in the adult 20% of the oxygen, um, yet is only 2% of the body weight. Mm -hmm. And actually, when when you the measurements have been made in newborn children show that at, at, around the time of birth, the um, consumption of the 
of energy by the brain is in the region of 60 to 70 percent of all the energy that's going from the mother. Wow. So the, the brain is using a phenomenal amount of energy, mm. absolutely phenomenal amount of energy. You feel your head, it's actually hot. And um, you feel, put your hand on the head of a dog or a pussy cat, and it's, it's hot compared to the rest of the body. And so that means it's using a lot of oxygen. That means the risk of peroxidation is very high. Mm. Now, these trace elements are essential for a variety of proteins mm -hmm. that are antioxidant. Yes. And the, this, this variety of proteins that are antioxidants protect in the cell membrane, uh, inside the cell, inside the energy producing parts of the cell, things called mitochondria. Mm -hmm. So they're distributed throughout all different aspects of the cell, protecting it against peroxidation. Mm -hmm. And docosahexaenoic acid is very susceptible to peroxidation. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, it's not just DHA that's important in the brain foot web. It's also these trace elements. Okay. They're not so, they're available on, on land foot, foot web, the trace elements, but not so well. And, you know, today we have a real problem, still have a problem with iodine deficiency, for example, yes. which you don't have in the coastal regions. No, no. And so um, uh, it, it wasn't just DHA that is important from, it, it was all these accessory nutrients that Indeed. was is available in the marine food web as right. well. And also, we'd, I guess, uh, back in that time, we, they didn't have the problem that we face today of um, prolific use of uh, herbicides which bind to these trace elements in the oh, soil, like, like, glyphos yeah. like glyphosate, yeah. for instance, um, which means that if, if people are not eating a seafood-rich diet then and they're relying on land-based animals like cows, for instance, which obtain yeah. their copper intake from grass and that comes from the soil, yeah. if the soil is depleted, then overall we're becoming less and less yeah. enriched with with these trace elements. And hence, even if we do supplement or eat more DHA, the question is, is it becoming yeah. peroxidized and whilst after ingestion? So that's very interesting. Thank you, um, Professor Cork. Yeah. Interesting. And I mean, they're, even, they're even sort of a linking, or uh, have been linking sort of dementia and, and um, Alzheimer in part of uh, mm. peroxidative processes. Indeed. Indeed. There is another aspect to uh, EPA uh, and DHA, I should say, um, with regards to some of the things that our listeners who are, who are predominantly men uh, would be interested in which would be things like um, muscle protein synthesis and also recovery and it's something that I came across quite quite a number of years ago in my practice when I saw that there was a link between uh, uh, DHA and e EPA enrichment and a relationship between reduced chance of sarcopenia so there seems to be say, say that again there seems to be a relationship in some of the literature behind uh, enrichment of the diet with omega-3 fatty acids yeah. and sarcopenia and the authors at the time suggested it could be related to muscle protein synthesis that these omega-3 fatty acids reduce yeah. reduce the, the breakdown of amino acids or make them more available to uh to anabolic effects and yeah. it makes me wonder that whether this might have been uh, an impact on uh human development in in the past um as well in allowing us to 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 grow faster and whether it's still relevant today to uh, individuals yeah. who are trying to preserve muscle mass, either because they're, that's their goal or they're an athlete, or indeed if they're older and trying to prevent yeah. sarcopenia. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not so sure about all of that, but, but I think the one thing that we do know is that um, uh, protein comes is, is, is a, a different story, and, and protein is involved in muscle mass, of course. Hmm. But um, there is a, it's quite interesting that exercise actually enhances your ability to cope with, uh, manage DHA. And I think mm -hmm. there's a, a reverse connection between, obviously, the, the, the neural connections with muscle uh, are, are critically important and they depend on DHA. Interesting. And that's and that's um, is there any particular modality of exercise that you um, that you mentioned there, Professor Crawford? Is it more the resistance training or is it aerobic or does it not matter? 
that you've seen? Yeah, I've, I've no idea what which it is. I mean, it's not not my field as an <laughs> exercise. <laughs> but Indeed. um, uh, I would of suspect that. that there is a connection there because it, it works both ways. That um, uh, DHA is responsible for the nervous system, mm -hmm. not just the brain, of course, and and also that it's been shown that um, exercises include um, in enhances without it doing anything else exercise simply enhances your ability to make use of dha so you get a better dha status through exercise it's fascinating i've never heard that before that the exercise itself actually improves your ability to use uh, dha which again lends itself yeah. more strongly to one should be putting as much emphasis on movement yeah. and exercise yeah. as much as they are on on nutrition um which is a, it's a fascinating aspect and also uh just to recall what you said before about the, the development of um, infants, young children as well, the importance of movement and exercise oh, yeah, absolutely. young children. Um, yeah. I mean, we tend to think of that as just being a, an anti-obesity strategy, but actually, as you say, it might also be enhancing their use of DHA um, and perhaps having some sort of differential effect there as well. Yeah. Very, very interesting. And I, I, the other thing I wanted to, to touch on, if, if you don't mind also, is, is this... Um, you mentioned before about uh, New York being uh, one of these centers for uh, was one of these areas that was rich with um, with with seafood, oysters. Oysters, oysters, oyster oysters. capital of the world, oyster capital of the world, and and if that it seems to be the case that that then throughout human ancestry that that the the relative abundance of DHA in the food chain is is just going downward effectively, yes. and so obviously if that's the case. In terms of the the sources of DHA that are available to oneself, obviously, um, if you can get fatty fish, um, then that's that's brilliant. But if you are limited to um, uh, to to supplementation because of where you live or the economic factors, what is the what is the the, the relative difference between obviously getting it from a natural source um, from seafood versus a supplement? And I'd imagine some of that is related yeah. to oxidation. You know, well, there are two two things, of course. So, but the important one that's, that's, uh, we've already mentioned is the presence of all, all these trace elements, iodine, mm -hmm. selenium, zinc, and so on. And um, they're so critical for, for the health of the brain. And um, But the, the second thing that I seem to think, think is important is that the, the supplements that, that are used come from fish oil. Mm -hmm. Now, fish oil is different to the system used by all tissues where you have DHA, and particularly, of course, the brain and the visual system. There you have not oils, but you have phospholipids. Mm. And um, so if, if you're giving oils, uh, it, it's, it's, it's missing out on the phospholipid component, which is, is critical, things like choline, serine, and inositol that are um, uh, used in, to make up these membranes. You have the choline phosphoglycerides on the outer side of the membrane, esthenolamine in the, in the inner side, and then you have distributed mm. inositol and serine phosphoglycerides. And the, this is a quite a complex system, the phosphoglyceride component of the cell membrane, which applies to every cell in the body. Um, and for the, to use DHA uh, or the, anything, any of these other essential fatty acids that are involved in building cell membranes, to use them, they have to be in the phospholipid form. Mm -hmm. So the body has to convert whatever comes in as oil, which is a triglyceride, um, has to strip the, the triglyceride mm -hmm. and then find choline, ethanolamine and serine from somewhere and put them all together and then use them for the brain or the muscle or the toenails or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a different board game mm -hmm. eating fish compared to eating the oil. Yes. Now, let me give you an example. <clears throat> in cod, if you look at the meat of cod, 
um, that's what we eat. Uh, we don't eat the oils of cod, we eat the meat. <clears throat> um, the phospholipids in the meat, which are present not in a large amount, but present in a small amount, because meat is mostly water, mm -hmm. right? um, contain 47% DHA. 47% DHA. Mm -hmm. The cotiver oil contains 12% um, EPA and 8% DHA. Mm -hmm. So there you have a huge difference mm -hmm. right at the beginning because in the muscle itself is predominantly DHA 47%. Um, there's only about less than 1% EPA present. And there's, there's less than sort of what the DHA just dominates. It, it's almost getting up to the sort of level you have in the photoreceptor, which is about 50%. So that, there again is a huge difference in terms of eating um, allicin phospholipid, mm. which is the form this, the body is going to use. And if you look at things, the way that nature handles things, she's really um, fairly economical, and she likes to use things preformed mm. rather than having to make them. And she can make them all, but she likes to likes to have them preformed, and and so uh, the, ha having the preformed phospho phospholipid is what you get in the meat, mm. as opposed to the cotiver oil, and and yeah. you now have forty seven percent DHA as opposed to eight percent. Interesting. So, so I, if I think about this as a sort of spectrum of, of usefulness, uh, the if you take your highly purified omega-3 fatty acids um, at one end of the spectrum as a supplement, they're going to be not totally useless, but 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 less but less beneficial because of the lack of these additional trace elements and and the phospholipids. Then you have uh, your traditional cod liver oil, which sure. which obviously was used extensively, you know, 60, 70 years ago, but obviously today is, is less is less fashionable, but obviously mm -hmm. contains vitamin A and sometimes vitamin D as well. So there are some some complementary elements, but as you say, still without the uh, the array of phospholipids that are necessary and also those trace elements. And then at the yeah. very top, you've got the gold standard, which would be eating seafood yeah. and fish predominantly. So it... it, it it, that's really fascinating, Professor Corbin. I think also it, it then just reinforces the fact that, as you said, you can't really be a food first approach, really. You can't out supplement your way through this problem. You're only going to get a slice of the, uh, yeah. the action uh, and certainly yeah. that's the benefit overall for the brain. Yeah, Does... let's not knock the supplements completely. I mean, they, they are, yeah. of course, useful, especially for people who somehow, for bizarre reason, can't think why. It probably starts early developmental stuff. <clears throat> don't like fish, but um, the majority of people will eat fish. During World War Two, for example, um, uh, most foods were rationed, but yes. was, fish and seafood were never rationed. Ah, that's and, something I didn't know. They, 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 we enjoyed a huge um, ah, interesting. beef air during the war because fish and seafood were never rationed that's interesting because you're absolutely right my, my my father actually still has his ration book from when he was a child he was right, there, right. okay and, and uh he's right at the end of the the second world war he he, he was yeah. there but they still had the books and you're absolutely correct there's, there's there's no nothing there about uh fish at all it's just the yeah. the lamb-based meats and, and other things as well so that that's yeah. that's fascinating so clearly the the uk certainly would have been uh, abundantly enjoying seafood and fish as much as possible because it's what yeah. we collect from our, our seas. And, and the other thing interesting was we were all told to sort of um, have chickens in our backyard somehow or other. Mm. And, of course, hen's eggs have got DHA in them as well. Mm. But I guess that also depends on the sort of diet that they're fed as well. If oh, yeah. Uh, yes. I mean, the, 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 there's, there's no doubt about that. I mean, we, we've studied the... Um, a composition of of um, chicken meat, for example, in 1970 compared to 2000, and, um, to, to, to compared to 2000, and um, there was a huge difference. The, yeah. the amount of DHA fell from 170 milligrams to per 100 grams of meat to um, 25. Goodness. 
uh, and which are huge drop when they purely explained by the fact that, that now 95 percent of the chicken meat that's sold is comes from intensively reared stuff where they don't get access to the omega-3 in the field exactly exactly so this kind of again the intensivity of agriculture and uh and livestock you know husbandry is is really decimating i i would i would use the term the, the, the well yes because because um in, in in the during human evolution of course the, the birds and um, their eggs and small mammals would have mm. been a source of dha from the land-based food web mm. so um as i said it was the best of both worlds if you had yeah. Indeed, and 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 I think um, I mean this is seen still today with modern hunter gatherers. The, the human beings would have eaten the entire animal, presumably they wouldn't have wasted anything. So they would have included things yeah. like the brain, which is obviously the rich, richest source. Well, of... yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a quite, quite an important point because actually, when you stop and think about it, whatever you think about what we would was powering that evolution from three hundred and forty cc's to one thousand seven hundred. Whatever you think was going on, whatever your belief system was, mm. <laughs> and I like to try and link it to a little bit of science, just not wholly with science. Whatever you think about that, the important thing is that um, that powering system was based on wild foods. Mm. Now, when you think, you've just used that expression, when you think about wild foods, compared to what we're eating today, mm. you begin to wake up and realize uh, why we, our brains are shrinking. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And it just shows... Um, yeah, It's a very simple sort of thing to do. You know. Quite, quite. Just one one final question, Professor Crawford, if you don't mind. And it's been absolutely fascinating to to even talk about this area. And I think it's been rich listening for uh, for those listening in. Is just a further question on the supplement side of things as well. Right. So I recall from um uh, a, another podcast that you did uh, that I listened to is that you have a uh, a way of telling the quality of some of these supplements. I believe by by biting the capsule. <laughs> Um, please, if you don't mind, explain the the the, the, the Crawford approach to uh, in quality. Well, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, fascinating. You should recall that. So, I, I the the um, yes, uh, and I I do take Crawford a lot of time to time, but I don't take it in a capsule. I take it in the bottle because wow. I know if if um, I swig out a swig out of the bottle. I, I immediately know if it's off in any oh. way because it, you, you can taste it. And um, and yes, if you want to check whether the uh, supplements that you've got, you bite the capsule, and if it burns the back of your throat, you you throw them away. Right, it's gone rancid. Because it, it's clear that the, this is now uh, peroxidized stuff. Is, as we've talked about before, DHA and all the other uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, including EPA and so on, are very susceptible to peroxidation. Mm -hmm. And um, I once had, I had a bunch of people coming to me with, with some fancy new oil that they wanted me to do something about and, um, and help them sell the stuff. And, and the, I, I took a bite of the capsule and I, I had to immediately run out of the room and, and wash it down with, with water to try and get rid of the burning sensation at the back of my throat. Wow. And that was the end of the discussion. Wow. And and, and, I, and I, I would imagine as well that some of these uh, supplements that are that are mixed with other types of uh, oils, like, for instance, olive oil or sunflower yeah. oil, etc., they're going to be even more potentially susceptible to peroxidation too, and hence they might have even gone rancid. Olive oil might, might actually help protect it because it's okay. stuff full of um, antioxidants, um, polyphenols and things like that. Um, mm. So it's a, it's a, olive oil is a good oil, there's no question about it, but um, um, there you go. Interesting. Interesting. Well, Professor Crawford, it's been so interesting to talk to you about this fascinating area. And I'm sure it's been, again, as I said, rich listening for those um, about uh, DHA. And perhaps now they have a better understanding of the quality as well of maybe those supplements that they've got on their shelf, too. So thank you so much for the time. Bite the capsule.
Right, the catch on. <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Rick. Thank you. It's a great pleasure talking Thank to you. you. Thank you.